Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for taking the time out of what I'm sure is a busy day. Um, thank you to everyone involved with the chamber for having myself and the rest of these gentlemen up here uh, to talk about some really interesting topics that might uh, have an impact potentially sooner than you think on your businesses, your municipalities, and your personal life. Um, excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold, so I might sniffle once in a while. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, the title tentatively of this gathering is Artificial Intelligence and Mixed Reality. And I just wanted to take a couple quick minutes to give an explanation and start a discussion at kind of a high level about what those things are. And then I'll dive into what I'll be talking about, uh, specifically about artificial intelligence and marketing. So. As Steve mentioned, I am a marketing consultant. I work in online marketing. I help businesses uh, sell more, generate more leads, get more traffic uh, online. And that includes a ton of different activities using a ton of different technologies. That's my day job. Now, my second job at this point is as the director of the Marketing Artificial Intelligence Institute, which is a website created by PR 2020, our marketing agency, that educates marketers on what artificial intelligence is and how it's going to affect our industry. So I am still, like I'm sure many people in the world, trying to figure this all out, figure out what is AI, why do we hear about it so much, what is virtual reality, what is mixed reality, how are these technologies going to affect our lives and our businesses? So that's kind of where I come from to this subject, and I'm sure you'll have many other uh, great backgrounds of very technical experts who are also at this table who are going to go into their areas of expertise. So I am more on the marketing side of understanding how AI and AI software is going to affect that particular industry. Excuse me. Now, at a high level, what is AI and what is mixed reality? So I'm going to try to keep this very basic, but think of artificial intelligence as kind of the software piece of this. It's the stuff that's running in the background on a lot of different machines you might be using uh, and on a lot of different websites and a lot of different companies that you interact with. Now, the mixed reality portion of it may use some artificial intelligence technologies and may use some more traditional technologies, but as you've seen, it's more hardware-based. You can wear it and immerse yourself in a different world. So I'm going to show you in my presentation how AI is more behind the scenes, and then I think we're going to see very clearly how mixed reality, AR, and VR are very much in your face. So, the presentation I've got today is tentatively titled Marketing in the Machine Age, The Path to a More Artificially Intelligent Future. So we're going to talk a little bit about how artificial intelligence impacts marketing, but really more I wanted to structure this to show you how artificial intelligence is being used by every single person in this room already, and you probably have used it multiple times a day. So hopefully, I hope you can come out of this with an understanding of what AI is and an understanding of how it might impact you in the future. So this is a <laughs> very fancy illustration from a great website called Wait But Why. It's run by a guy named Tim Urban, who I think is out of Silicon Valley, and he writes very uh, extensive and really in-depth articles on different types of technology. He wrote a great article called The AI Revolution, which I encourage everyone to check out. And it starts with this chart. So on the left, you see human progress. On the right, you see time. And to us in 2018, it feels like we're standing on that little upswing there. Technology has improved. We see very interesting tech being used every day. And we expect that line to kind of progress, you know, gradually upwards. Now, the reality is, the line might go like this. So lots of different technologies that we're just starting to get comfortable with 
have the potential to create exponential progress, which means we could go very straight up very fast um, using technologies like artificial intelligence and virtual reality and mixed reality. Now, we'll see how much this comes to pass, but the big thing to keep in mind is that artificial intelligence can make other technological breakthroughs more likely happen faster and just potentially transform other industries. So we may have an exponential effect of what AI can do for our businesses and in our lives. So we always talk about how change velocity will be fueled by artificial intelligence, just meaning that AI can be the tool and the technology that makes every other breakthrough easier and faster. And this seems to be echoed by a few people who tend to know what they're talking about. So Google's current CEO, Sundar Pichai, once said, AI is one of the most important things that humanity is working on. It's more profound than electricity or fire. Now, it's a big statement, and I hope in the few minutes I have, I can qualify it a little bit, and we can come away with understanding why someone like Google's CEO might be so excited about the potential of AI. But first, Let's answer the big question. What is AI? The best definition we've found is from a guy named Demis Hassabis, who founded a company called DeepMind, which was bought by Google uh, several years ago. And it's the science of making machines smart. That sounds really simple and really vague, but find 10 AI experts and get them in a room, and you'll get 10 different definitions of exactly what the technology is. So at a high level, we like to look at it as the science of making machines smart. And then we like to add our own little qualifier to that, which in turn augments human knowledge and capabilities. So a lot of technology we use today is still really dumb. It requires humans to code rules into it, and then the machine follows those rules. Whereas certain AI technologies and developments mean that machines can actually teach themselves uh, new ways of doing things. So you're going to hear, if you read anything about AI, all sorts of terms. For our purposes today, I just want to kind of visualize for you that artificial intelligence is that big circle. And within that circle, there's a lot of different other technologies and tools that you might hear about. You could spend a very long time going into what each of these mean. I know because I've spent about two years so far <laughs> doing it. But just to understand and contextualize, when you hear these terms, these are all different types of AI technologies. So you th see things like machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, natural language generation, computer vision, image recognition. These are all related. They don't all do the same thing. In fact, they do quite different things often. And they're not all at the same level of advancement. So just to understand, the field can get pretty complex pretty quick. But at the core, we talk about it in terms of AI uses algorithms. And an algorithm is a set of instructions that tells a machine what to do. That's all it is. Except the big difference with AI is that the machine can sometimes create its own algorithm. So instead of a person telling a machine exactly what to do, the person could instead give the machine a broad set of goals, and the machine figures out how to achieve the goals on its own. So we'll get into what that looks like. So for marketing, for instance, if we have an event we want to promote, and a visitor registers for the event, a very natural response for marketers would be, hey, let's send them a three-part email campaign to let them know the event is coming up. You, that might have even happened at some of your past chamber events. You may have received notifications, emails, some type of communication that said, okay, here's some more details about your event, and here is a, where you sign up, and here are the details getting very close to the event in a way to engage potential attendees. But modern marketing gets really complicated really quick. So what if there, instead of 50 registrants all going to one place, all getting the same three-part email, what if there are 2,000 registrations? What if there's five different groups of people or customers we're trying to attract? What if they're across all different types of online channels and they all require personalized emails and website experiences? 
That is a big challenge of modern marketing today, is that we just have so much information coming in through online sources that actually speaking to customers one-to-one -one using technology is a massive challenge. And so for us, AI is a potential way to solve that. And so I'm going to show you a few basic examples of AI in your everyday life and try to describe to you how, it, how its power can help us at scale message and market to different people. So you may recognize this photo, it's Facebook, and Facebook uses AI all the time. So it says, want to tag Keith, yes or no? That is in fact Keith because Facebook knows what Keith's face looks like because it has been able to use facial recognition, which is a type of artificial intelligence, to determine who Keith is in every photo on, that is posted on Facebook. Like I said, you all have used AI because I I'm betting you all have smartphones, uh, and I'm betting at some point you have used either Google Search or you've used Siri or, some, or Amazon's Alexa or any type of voice assistant that is all artificial intelligence that powers that. You use it when you search. If you've ever used the Gmail uh, mail app on your phone, it actually recommends responses for you now because it can read your email and then write text. That's also artificial intelligence. Anyone who's binge-watched Netflix, you probably found your, your uh, next favorite show because of AI. It takes all the data from what you watch and how you watch it and how you rate it, and it recommends other things you might like. So this is an algorithm or a set of algorithms that determine your preferences. A lot of news sites also use it to recommend more things you might want to read. And, you know, the great topic for this Chamber of Commerce, Amazon is one of the leaders in artificial intelligence. Almost every product recommendation you're going to see on this site is driven by some type of AI recommendation system. So it can show you everything from related to things you've viewed in the past, related to past purchases, and then make uh, assumptions about what you might even like in the future based on that. This is a photo of what it looks like in, I believe, a Tesla self-driving car. The car itself actually is using image recognition um, and other types of computer vision systems to determine which things on the road are cars, which are obstacles, and navigate around those. So the whole point with this, and to bring it back to my uh, overall point and wrap this up for you, is that your life no matter what you do, is already assisted by machines. It is already assisted by artificial intelligence, and it's just the beginning. If you think of how many opportunities and how many tools and how many things are possible because of simple things like Amazon recommendations, Netflix recommendations, Google search, these are all AI-powered innovations. And at the Marketing AI Institute, we tend to think that they will accelerate everything else. So, Google search alone has changed how marketing works in a short decade. Um, your life is already machine assisted and we believe your business's marketing eventually will be too. So I'm gonna end with a few uh, brief recommendations for no matter what type of business you are, these might be useful ways to think about how AI could start to work with whatever type of marketing you do uh, and wherever you do it. So we always tell people to look at the repetitive and manual marketing tasks that you might someday be able to automate. So what are the things you do on a daily basis or that your teams do that they just don't like doing? I mean, we have so many things we do as a marketing agency that frankly, like our people shouldn't even be spending time on. I mean, but we have to because in the past we've had to do things manually. There's plenty of tasks that now certain types of AI tools can do for you. Uh, you know, more and more companies have some type of data, whether that's customer data, whether it's website data. Data is what makes AI so powerful. You need, it, if you have any type of data, there may be more ways to get more things out of it using some type of AI tool. And then lastly, for some businesses, you're already using either free or paid uh, technology tools to run your business or to run your marketing. A lot of those tools are now actively uh, implementing AI in their system. So a great place to start is with the technology you already use. And so 
hopefully briefly it gives you kind of a good idea of why AI might be a little more important than you might think and how it's everywhere, including in your pocket, in your smartphone, on your television, on your website, and eventually it will be in your business and in your marketing. I'll share a quote from Grace Hopper that is, the most dangerous phrase in the language is we've always done it this way. Here's that new health education campus building that you can probably drive by. It's on Chester Avenue on Cleveland Clinic's main campus. This was an original concept drawing, but it's very near completion. Students will be going there next year. And as I said, there won't be a cadaver lab. We'll be teaching anatomy entirely through a mixed reality headset, the Microsoft HoloLens. When you think about it, human anatomy learning hasn't changed that much in hundreds of years. You get a cadaver or you get medical illustrations from a textbook. A lot of it is very two-dimensional. Before we even knew of the HoloLens, we experimented with other technologies. This is an, an anatomage table that is viewing anatomy on a giant touch screen. It's very nice, though still two-dimensional. And it's very hard to learn something as intimately three-dimensional as the human anatomy in uh, a two-dimensional media. Like, this is a brain scan of white matter fiber tracks of the brain. So imagine trying to figure out in your brain how all these fibers wrap around each other from just this 2D image. It is extremely difficult. So we had a big problem to solve. How do we teach this 3D content with new technology? Well, thankfully, Toby Cosgrove, former president of uh, the Cleveland Clinic, was president at the time. He was actually old, old friends with this man, Craig Mundy, who was uh, advisor to the CEO of Microsoft. They were on a boat together. <laughs> and Craig said, <laughs> hey, why don't you come check out this super secret thing we've got cooking up? So Toby goes along with President Barbara Snyder and Dean Pam Davis, uh, dean of the med school at Case Western. And they contact our department, specifically my boss, Mark Griswold, and said, I need you on a plane to Redmond go to Microsoft, you need to see this thing. It's a game changer. Had no idea what was going to be seen. And what was seen was the ultimate game changer for us, which was the Microsoft HoloLens. It didn't look like this at the time. It was a bundle of wires and stuff that you wore. Now it's a lot more streamlined, self-contained headset that enables you to see holograms within the world around you. So this man's wearing a headset, you see, He's got his digital content, is now no longer limited to his screens, his computers, his tablets, his smartphone. The digital content is now blended. Is uh, that TV, that soccer game up there, that weather app, that uh, shopping list up there, it's all digital content that now just exists in the world that you can move around and experience as if it's actually there. So if you watch this video here. So I'm wearing the device. My coworker Henry is wearing the device, and the cameraman, the camera, is wearing the device. So this cadaver here, he's not actually there. He's made of light. We call him Kevin. <laughs> and you can see you can actually move around and look around at what's going on as if it's actually here. So let's contrast, contrast that with virtual reality. Now, virtual reality is awesome, and you're going to hear some great things, probably seen some great things from some virtual reality innovators around here. And for like really immersive, self-contained experiences, it is quite incredible. But we had the unique challenge of, we have to build a classroom. We got to have a professor dealing with five to 40 students in a classroom, all experiencing digital content together, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do in VR. How do you raise your hand, how do you ask a question, how do you point to what you want to ask a question about, how does a professor know if, some, if a student's engaged, if they're bored, if they're falling asleep, if anything, how can they do that unless they have that physical co-presence? And teachers, educators are very good at, uh, the good ones are very good at uh, gleaning that from just how a student is interacting with them on a physical level. To go back to uh, Mike's graph earlier about that human progress starting to go up, I would say that when you talk about human connectivity, we've almost gone down a little bit in recent years because, and I'm as guilty of it as anyone, we're all on our screens, we're on our phones, we're on uh, our tablets, we're on our computers. But now, if the digital content is around us, we are way more connected, and that starts to go up again. And this is part of a 
larger strategy we're working on here at my, my department, which is the Interactive Commons. We are uh, an interdisciplinary, I like to think of us as an anti-disciplinary department, where, and we have this right now, an anatomy professor is going to be there with a physics professor, going to be there with a chemistry professor, a crystallography professor, and even a dance professor, who, when you think about it, all deal in very 3D mediums. And they're going to have their stuff together, and they're going to be talking about how they solve problems. And these new connections are going to come together. There's going to be this serendipity of knowledge that then is going to connect and create whole new fields of knowledge. Because students now could probably learn anything by going to YouTube. So in 10 years, what's going to make them want to go to a college, go to a university? And we think it's this. We think it's going to be bringing all this knowledge together and sharing it. So that's us, the Interactive Commons. We've been going strong for about two years now in the center of uh, Case's campus. And we're not just limited to anatomy. Like I said, we've done other things with HoloLens. There's 30 students in the upper left in a physics class. Another physics class, astronomy, you see some crystallography, some chemistry. Down at the bottom there, those are uh, student projects that they did with the Hollands on music learning and energy mapping. And in addition, we did do a dance performance where dancers drove holograms and everyone in the audience, about 80 people, were watching uh, these dancers drive holograms around. Don't have time to share a video of that. Uh, to toot our own horn, we did have the first app in the App Store of the HoloLens. Uh, which is pretty exciting, uh, the first third-party app. Uh, so imagine getting to say you had you know, the first iPhone app in the App Store. I think it's just as good, if not more awesome, because I think this technology will become just as prevalent as smartphone, smartphones are today. Uh, so we got to present all our findings at the World Economic Forum to world leaders last year. And uh, I'll show you a video next of uh, the first holographic class of, in anything that ever took place, 40 students learning thoracic anatomy. Is that better? Go start the anatomy course app and click join session. You all see that you have models in front of you. All of us on the outside without HoloLenses just see you guys walking around in a room. <laughs> So can everybody go to the, to the posterior side of your model? So 100% of you walked around him. You already believe that this guy's here. So let's take it to the next level. I'm going to look with you at some of the musculoskeletal elements of the chest or the thoracic wall. If we look at the vertebral body and follow it posteriorly, you should see a small arch. Partial ribs are sometimes called floating ribs because they don't go all the way around. It's something easier to get the big picture right away because then you can see it all at once. So already we're seeing that we're developing a sort of x-ray type of vision, which is really exciting, isn't it? And I could come up from underneath and see like what the top of the diaphragm looks like compared to the bottom and what passes through where. And we're going to focus now on the aorta. And you can see the aorta is a candy cane type structure. In the aorta, we were in lab this week and we were trying to like figure out how the aorta is like positioned and where the branches come off. And here it was just so easy to see because we could peel away everything else. Now we've added on the vascular tree. You even see like the pulmonary arteries in the back, like the branches. Oh wow. I thought it was amazing, like all these minor details that you kind of miss in cadaver lab. And, but here you have everything that's laid out to you and it's spatial relationships with all the skeletal structures too. It was phenomenal. Because in the real cadaver, a lot of structures are kind of hidden. So you can't really see them or find them even. And here you can actually see the relationship between the structures and the really, really tiny structures especially. Those are really helpful. I felt like it was actually a really good group dynamic that I wasn't expecting to be able to have with this. And I could see everybody and then it was really overlay and onto the reality. So that was really amazing. You know, I thought it'd be cool to see the HoloLens in action, but I didn't expect it to actually be as educational as it was. And I feel like I'm kind of pumped to go One study five. and kind of solidify those details. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jeff. That was pretty amazing. Um, we actually are working with some... I do. Um, we are working with some robotic type of applications with those, those goggles, so it's, it's pretty cool to see what we're going to do in the future with manufacturing. <clears throat> but right now, uh, we, we have been using virtual reality for, uh, at Lincoln Electric for ten, over, a little over 10 years now. My background um, was in the Army, 
I was in the Army for 22 years. The, uh, the military has been using virtual reality since the late 50s. Okay? You think about it. What is virtual reality, right? It, it, it's not necessarily the computer-generated stuff, but it's a mechanized way to do a task. The military has been using shooting simulators since the 50s. Okay? We adapted this technology... Um, I say we, Lincoln Electric. In the Army, we actually started using this back in 2005. Lincoln Electric got on board in 2008 and bought the software that we were using. And so what we're doing with this is we're doing everything from teaching students how to weld. We're teaching uh, manufacturers how to screen people. And we're using it for recruiting purposes. We're also using it for robotic applications based around manufacturing uh, technologies. This is where welding generally starts in the classroom. Now, one of the things we look at is how many middle, middle schools out there do we know have welding programs? I can tell you right now there's seven. Seven across the United States, not just in Ohio. There's two here in Ohio. But they are all based on virtual applications. If you think about what we're doing in welding, there's a lot of science in welding. There is a lot of math in welding. There's a lot of technology in welding. So what we can do is we can take welding, what they're learning in the welding classroom, and relate that and meet core standards inside the science classroom. Anybody have any idea how many elements on a periodic table elements a welder can come across on a daily basis? About 43. Okay, That's the type of science that nobody relates to welding. When you think of welding, what do you think of? Pipeline, dirty, hard work. We don't think about the science involved around it. Lincoln Electric hires very few welders. We have a chemistry lab of 103 chemists. We have an engineering program. 90% of our sales force are all engineers. But the welding industry don't think about that. Where I'm sorry, people don't think about that in the welding industry. We All we relate it to is that... That, that person laying in the mud out on the pipeline. We don't think about virtual reality being involved with welding. Virtual training has really helped us step up our game. It has changed what we do in welding education. It's allowed us to do a blended training program. It has allowed us to do follow standards more efficiently. Simply because now the way that we do welding inspection is based on interpretation. It's based on what I think that manual says. When we introduce the virtual reality machines, it is based on the fact. It either is or it isn't. There is no, well, maybe. Welders tend to learn through repetition. What's the problem with that? Every time a welder strikes a live arc, it costs money. When they strike an arc on our simulators, it's the same price across the board. It's seven cents a kilowatt hour because that's what it costs to run the computer. There is no more cost involved than that seven cents a kilowatt hour. In actual welding, every time a student strikes an arc, depending on the joint they're working on, it can cost upwards of thirty, forty, fifty dollars. And if I'm doing a repetitive motion, that means I have to do that a lot to get that muscle memory down pat. But if I can train students on virtual reality, I can greatly reduce my training costs. And because of virtual reality, I can do a lot more things, like teaching them how to set up the, the machine in between each weld. In actual welding, we get in the habit of going in, setting the machine up to where it's perfect, and never touching it again, because I don't want to change it. In virtual reality, every time they go to a new weld, they have to go back and set the machine up, because we want them to learn that process. We want that to be as much muscle memory or second, hand na uh, second nature as it is to actually do the weld. Because that's one of the biggest parts of doing the welding program, is learning how to set your equipment up properly. Muscle memory. That's what welding is. That's why robots are so good at it. They do the same thing over and over again. So with virtual reality, that's what we can teach our welders to do at a much lower cost and in a much faster time. Teamwork and collaboration. I can put multiple students around a virtual reality because there's no liability. Safe. 
There's no chance of those students standing around watching and critiquing of them getting hurt. We get instant feedback. The generation we're trying to get into our workforce today absolutely loves instant feedback and gratification. They want to know that they've done a good job right now. And that's what these systems do for us. They give that instant feedback. <clears throat> they also pick things up that we can't do in traditional welding. I can't see through a student's eyes, but these systems allow us to do that. I can't pick up slight movements or ticks in a weld, but these systems allow us to do that. It allows us to figure out what body position is. And we figured this out because what works for me, the instructor, may not work for you. It may not be a comfortable way for you to get that weld accomplished. But we can figure out 90% of what we have to do in the lab before we step out to the lab through virtual reality. Reduces anxiety. Why? How does it reduce anxiety? Anybody welded before? Were you anxious the first time you struck an arc? I mean, you think about it. We're dealing with thousands of degrees of malted metal. We're dealing with hundreds of amps of electricity when 0.1 amp is enough to stop your heart. So, of course, there's anxiety. But how does virtual reality reduce it? By building confidence. So if I put a student on virtual reality and they consistently score in the 80s and 90s, they build their confidence. And when I'm confident about something, I'm not anxious about it because I know that I have those capabilities. And so we know that by getting the students on here and it's succeeding in virtual reality, they can get, succeed faster in the actual shop because they're not intimidated by it anymore. They're not scared of it anymore. Recruiting. Getting recruiters in welding. When I take this to an event, I can allow students that are 8, 9, 10 years old to try welding. I can't do that with a live welding machine. We were at an event in FFA and I had a little girl come up. She was in shorts and flip-flops, cute, cute as she could be. And she got on there and filled the entire screen up with weld. And I had grown adults in the line saying, hey, it's my turn. You know, it's like, stop. She had a blast doing it. But she never would have had that chance without virtual reality. Because I can't put her in those in, in, in live fumes and, and, and sparks and, and things like that. I can't do that. But with virtual reality, I gave her an opportunity to see what welding was like. Pre-test and preparation. I can get students to come in here and pass a virtual bin test for certification. They can practice all day long. And Iowa State University actually did a study on virtual simulation in the welding field, and they found that students in the in position welds, that's flat and horizontal, can train solely on virtual reality and go out and pass a certification test in the live shop. 100%, they had a 100% certification rate on students that trained on nothing but virtual reality and went out and performed the task in the live shop and passed the certification rate. Blended training, now we know that I can't just take a student, put them on virtual reality and say okay, you're ready to go out to manufacture, hang upside down on a crane and do some welds. We know that. We can't do that. But what we can do is we can blend the training. We'd like to think, think that it's around a 50-50 split. 50% 50 of the time on the virtual reality, 50% of the time in a live lab. It's been suggested that we can be as much as a 70% to 30%. And the more time I spend in virtual reality, the more money I save in the actual lab. Robotics and advanced manufacturing systems like Jeff just talked about. We're doing something similar with a robotic cell where the, the student can walk around the entire robotic cell, put the parts inside of it, and actually create welding programs for it, all based in your virtual environment. The cost, based on what a robotic cell cost, is fractions of what it really is. An actual robotic cell, just that cell there, it's an education cell, is around $80,000. But I can get a virtual system for a tenth of that. We have virtual programming systems. What happens if I crash a virtual robot? Nothing. What happens if I crash my actual robot? It can be twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars worth of damage. I teach at Cuyahoga Community College down at the Metro campus. I teach robotic welding on Saturdays. And 90%, 80% of my class is done in virtual reality. 
we have run one robot and I have 12 students. 80% of the time I'm in the computer lab teaching the students how to program on virtual reality. Once they get it figured out in the virtual reality, we go down to the live robot and they run it live. 80% of our time we're doing it on virtual software. A blended, a blended training uh, technique is what we really have to approach. We know in manufacturing, especially in the welding industry, I can't just let them say, okay, virtually. Right now I can't say that. When we start getting artificial intelligence involved, I can actually have somebody, we're already looking into this, I can have somebody run a weld while out in the shop the robot's mimicking that exact same movement. We're already practicing that. It's not there yet, it's not ready for market. But this is what virtual reality did for us in welding education. It allowed us to train students faster. It allowed us to train students 42% higher certification rate better. It allowed us to change student, train students cheaper. We save about $34 per coupon. And on average, each student is welding faster, welding uh, acceptably, in about six to seven sets of coupons faster. So you can do the math and figure it out. It pays for itself. Your return on investment with these systems is very rapid. The benefits of using this type of training, we go green. Of course, we're not creating consumables. We're not creating weld fume. We're not wasting electricity. There's a lot of advantages to using virtual reality and welding simulation. We enable multilingual instruction. Our systems are currently capable of communicating in 12 different languages. I, however, barely speak English. <laughs> okay. But, case in point, I had the president of FANUC Robotics at Lincoln Electric. Mr. I don't remember his name. I call him Fujiyami, but I don't remember his name. But he came there and he was baffled. I think he might have called me a moron because I was operating our machine in Japanese. But when he tried to talk to me in Japanese, I didn't understand a word he was saying. So he couldn't figure out how I could operate this machine in Japanese, but not be able to speak the language. It's because all I'm doing in the machine is changing the characters on the buttons. The buttons do the same thing. I'm just a dumb welder. I know how to push a button that whatever in, in, in Japanese it says, but it does that in English, so I know what to do. He just, he had a problem figuring that out. Guys, there's so many different advantages to using virtual reality, augmented reality, and things like that, that in the, it's changing. I mean, it really is changing the way we do welding education and training. It's changing the way we do manufacturing training. It is allowing us to do more with less. It's allowing us to do more stuff in less time. We can get the students to train on different things that they never could have trained on because of cost. Pipe welding, any idea how much pipe cost? Any idea what's going on across the United States in pipe welding? 43,000 miles of pipelines being put in within the next five years. That all has to be welded. We haven't figured out a safe way to screw the pipes together to let gas not leak out of them. So what do we do? We weld every bit of it. 43,000 miles of pipelines coming in. How many high schools do you think can afford to bring pipe into their welding programs? It's expensive. One side of the pipe coupons that we use at Lincoln Electric, just one piece, you have to have two to make a joint, is $19. So before the student even strikes an arc, it's a $40 setup. And a student can ruin that in 10 seconds. And they do the right thing and grind it out. No, they throw it in the scrap metal, they grab two new pieces, and they start over. So within those 10 seconds, they just wasted $80. But through virtual reality, we can now add that type of training at no additional cost. Hi, hey guys. I'm Mike Dudas from the Lubrizol Corporation. Uh, I'm creative manager there for the advanced materials section. And uh, what that allows me to do is work with a bunch of uh, different technological channels. Um, and we get approached on business needs where they're coming out with either a new formulation or a new product or something of that nature. And uh, they need us to, to kind of help them bring it to life. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through what this was. It was uh, the Carver Paul Smart Polymers VR experience. 
And the, the first thing was, why? You know, what, what do we need to use? Um, they wanted to come out and communicate this launch of our, our new Smart Polymers piece, and they weren't sure exactly how they wanted to do it. There's traditional ways to do things, videos, ads, stuff like that. Um, they knew for a fact that we were going to be launching this at a trade show. Um, so right off the bat, we thought, okay, you know, uh, how much push do we have behind this thing? And, and what are you guys trying to communicate? So they came through and they let us know, okay, here's the breakdown for the actual formulation itself. It's easier to formulate with. This polymer cuts out certain pieces and parts in a formulation and it makes it faster. It's more efficient. So, okay, now we've got some information on it. Um, do we need to do VR for this? Is this something we could just build in a video? Uh, could we sell, save money and time and just do it that way? Um, one, the impact itself uh, to see the efficiency through each stage of the process was probably going to be lost if we did it in a video or some type of infographic or something like that. Um, so the last part of why was uh, show our investment into our own technology, show that we're excited about it, and show that we really want all of these folks at these trade shows to experience what we're doing. So that's, that's that last bullet point, which is collect contacts and leads, right? That's the, the overarching. Um, so at that point, it was, all right, how are we going to pull this off? Uh, we had not done a virtual reality experience, uh, to my knowledge, at Lubrizol before. Um, we had worked in augmented reality before. We had worked in a couple different approaches, but this, this would be probably our first venture. So we teamed up. Uh, we have an internal IS communications team. We started working with them, um, and we also started working with our business and really extracting all of the key points that they wanted to touch on inside of this VR experience. So um, the first bullet point kind of goes into educate on the restrictions of traditional rheology modifiers. Uh, I'm not sure who all in this room is going to be familiar with that, but basically traditional technology when it comes to formulations and new Carbapol smart technology when it comes to formulations. And we're trying to show how much more efficient our new stuff is. So okay, if we're going to do that, what, what's the best way to do it in a VR environment? Let the people interact with it. Let them use their hands. So we knew right off the bat, like, they're probably going to have to have some type of sensors so that they can see their hands in this VR world, they can push buttons, um, they can pour things, and that's initially where we wanted to go, was pick things up and pour it. Uh, there are a couple limitations because we started it early on in, in the VR world, so we ended up going with push button things. So they could push a button and it would pour something into this and now they can see that as they move through the VR experience, they don't need to do traditional steps. They're saving time as they formulate. Um, so we started to break it down into buckets. All right, we need to teach people how to use their hands. Then after they understand that they're in this VR world and they can use their hands, we need to show them how they formulate. Beyond that, what happens when they're mixing things together and formulating? They're diving into like this molecular world, this molecular experience. Um, so visualize that molecular interaction. And then from there, pull them right back out of it and let them look at what happens when you start to scale up with this new formulation, with this new polymer that you're using. So we started looking at things like best practice. If, if I'm in a VR world, what do I want to do? Like what's going to be fun? Uh, what is out there that's going to keep people moving? We don't want people to put it on, they get bored, they get confused, maybe they're slightly disoriented because unlike HoloLens, you're in this completely submersive world, right? You, don't, you can't see your surroundings anymore. You're in what we want you to see. Um, so Make It Fun was on the top of the list. We decided that instead of just letting people kind of wander through a VR environment, we would give, the, give them voiceover which we have little speakers that come out on the headset that lets a person with like this fun tone, um, this, this British VO that we contracted, kind of walk them through. Like, okay, here, you've been doing this for a while. Now try this. Now try this. This is what you would traditionally do. And it kind of takes them through the whole experience. So it's difficult for someone to put on the headset and kind of walk through it and get lost because there's, there's other things in there like a fail-safe technique. 
Um, if somebody is at the formulation bench for too long, so they're, they've got the headset on and they're pushing buttons and things are pouring and maybe they're just listening to the VO and they start to lose concentration, the VO will queue up and say, oh, don't forget to push the next button. Okay, you didn't push it? Here, we'll push it for you or we'll take control from here. So we, we call those fail-safe techniques where somebody can't get lost or bored in the environment because it's always moving. It keeps them engaged. Um, keep it light and quick. Uh, if, you're, if you're standing or if you guys got the chance to stand in the back and, and view it, if you're standing there looking at it without the VO and the sound and, and that instruction coming through to you, it can seem kind of long. When you're in the environment itself and you've got this fun personality talking you through things and you're learning how to use your hands and you're formulating, it, it tends to move pretty quickly. So that was one of the things we were nervous about is, is this experience going to be too long? Um, and understand the difference between full VR and mobile VR. This is something that we started to experience when uh, we took the app and we viewed it in our, our Oculus headset and it was fun and it was cool. And now we had to take out some of the functionality so that we could launch it on phones. Um, so we ended up doing that. And uh, it, it was a learning experience for sure. Uh, so again, some of those pieces that I talked about were the instructions. We created almost like a fun little circus or fair environment where there's these buttons and like beakers are spinning around and like there's a little torch with like flames coming out and you can blow a balloon up. But what it's doing is showing you one, that you have hands in this VR environment and two, how to use them. You can pick something up, you can put it down, you can hit a button, you can hit a balloon. We even started to experiment uh, or in the early on phases of it with the app development of blowing, like if you would just go like that and you could like move the balloon just by the, the uh, headset hearing the motion or the sound of that wind coming out, um, there's all kinds of different things you can do. We had talked about uh, also putting something together that had uh, like a smell or a scent because a lot of what Carbapol smart polymers are based around is body lotion or uh, bath and shower like shampoos, things like that. So if there was a scent that was maybe in this environment at the trade show, that would be an extra sensory brought into it. You know what I mean? Not only are you using your hands and you're hearing things and you're seeing things, but now like maybe a smell comes up. So that, that was another option that we could have brought into it. This is the formulation. So I didn't have a video of it. I'm hoping some of you will also take time and experience it. But this is the formulation aspect of it. The, the first one, again, was the instructional part where you learn how to use your hands. The second part then takes you into the formulation aspect where there's these buttons. And when it gets to the last button, it's add neutralizer, which you don't have to do with our polymer. That's what makes this so great. Like that's why this technology is awesome. And they'll go to hit it. The thing will pop up and it'll take off on its own. It's again, it's something fun that we threw in there. It's like a little RC car that takes off. Uh, then from there, it asks you to dive into like that molecular level, like, okay, do you want to see the micelles interacting with the surfactants? Sure you do. You're a chemist. You get in there, you start batting them around and pushing them in, and they start to build out, and they start to turn into something. You start to see the formulation happen. And it's at a basic level. We, we didn't, you know, dive into, like, these ex extensive CG pieces. We wanted to keep it very simple so a qualified audience could view it and completely understand what's happening, and an unqualified audience could view it and completely understand it. I think that's it, guys. Sorry, hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs>